Hello. You're still muted, by the way. I was just saying that whole thing I just did, that's the new like um, waiting room situation. Yeah. Where I had to like log into like. Well, the, well, the, the login was registration. Oh. Um, um, we're trying to do registration for the webinars um, so that we can have an attendee list to know who all was at the webinars. Got it. When it comes time, will I be able to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I thought you'd, some of you would want to do that. I just found out from Jim, I think it was yesterday, that the links to um, the sunrise plan that John had sent out, however long ago it was, they're all broken. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to actually show the intranet website that people should go to. So, Ooh, look and, at two people have entered the waiting room. Yeah, I'm in the waiting room, and uh, Andrew Weiss is in the waiting room. <clears throat> um, Jeff, did you notice anything about? Oh, I think it's me. I set up my satellite, but. I think I'm having trouble with my connectivity. Oh, at the moment, it seems good. It seems okay? Yeah. Okay. This uh, Andrew Weiss in the waiting room, he's not <clears throat> a presenter as well, is he? I can't remember who's, I can't remember who's talking. Is it just- uh, no, no, I don't know who that is. It's, it's Shalini and Liz and uh, Oaks, right? Yeah, your, your video is choppy, Mark, so maybe uh, Oh, yeah, he's probably, you know. Don't have a good connection. Jeff, can I ask you a question that's unrelated to the seminar? Yeah. So when they do the private Zooming and we have to do all waiting rooms, I have a family Zoom every Saturday. And of course, obviously, none of those people are UM and EDU. Do, normally, I just turn off the waiting room, but Am I just going to, am I still going to be able to allow those people in? Yeah, don't do the waiting room and just okay. do password encoded. It, it, you can either do password or waiting room. Okay. And when you do the password, you can have the password, you know, the password gets embedded in the link. So, you know, as long as they're clicking the link that you send out, you can have the password on and it's really pretty okay. transparent. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oops. <laughs> and Jeff will be on to help us with any problems. Yep. Jeff, I guarantee you're going to be riveted by the topic of conversation. I didn't say I was going to be paying attention. I'm going to be connected. <laughs> <I'm gonna> be <laughs> connected. <laughs> I have gotten pretty good at being in Zoom things and kind of watching for something to happen without actually being there to pay attention. We're getting to the point where people do well enough that they mostly don't need much help. So right. that's good, that's good. But it's uh, often reassuring to have somebody there just in case. <laughs> Well, yesterday, Catherine shared with me that there's many, many instructors who are having anxiety about guest speakers in their courses and whether or not the Zoom is going to work, whether or not there's going to be technical difficulties with the guest speaker. So that's yeah. something that comes up. Yeah. Um, especially with, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of frustrating that Zoom has been in a rapidly changing things to make things more safe and secure. And, you know, things just kind of keep changing in terms of how they work. <laughs> Hi, Shalini. Hi there. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Do you have any questions, Shalini? No. Um, 
I mean, do you have a general setup or general way you want us to kind of work this? Hopefully Michael will join. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you would all just um, take turns um, talking about your experience <clears throat> working on the, the research sunrise for the face-to-face -face, uh, research. <clears throat> um, I would just assume that, you know, there's a good portion of the audience that it ha is really curious and has a lot of questions about the process and how it worked. So I, I was just thinking a bit about the history. I don't know if you think Michael should go first, but it might not matter what the order is. Um, so this is going to be, I think, relatively informal, um, but I think it's, it's just such a critically important topic. I mean, I think, I think my diabetes study is, is one of the, is might be the first one back into the ECRC. So we're still really early in the process. So I think this is uh, really good timing. And I kind of anticipate that there might be a lot of questions. So I don't, I don't anticipate you people talking for a long time. Um, and then there might be a lot of questions and discussion. Um, and if there isn't, we can, we can end early. We'll just see how it goes. That sounds good. I mean, I think, you know, I can just talk about my role on this, um, on this sunrise committee, which was really just kind of last minute. And then, and, and, um, and I think just being able to ask people what kinds of questions they have, because we have a meeting every Thursday. So I can always go back to the committee and say, these are some of the issues coming up. Uh, you know, um, that's, that's kind of the role I want to play. Um, and then Liz really was the one who led the, uh, putting together the, like the kinds of documents that needed to fill out, but we can kind of, you know, chime in. Um, but Michael's the one who's really been in, I think, the thick of things and, and looking at kind of the ethics around it. And I think the other thing I can talk about is some of the issues we've faced with Tanzania, um, with the student project and just deciding to table it. So. Yeah, uh, examples are great. If, if you want to give examples. Um, and if I feel like it'd be helpful for me to chime in, I might do that because I have a lot of experience with getting back into the ECRC, but I don't know if that'll be necessary or not. Yeah, that would actually be helpful if you have that in your back pocket. Mark, just to kind of get the discussion going, um, because it is 9.58 and I don't know where Michael is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking it might be a long shot for Michael to get on early, given his schedule. Uh, we can wait a couple minutes. Um, it would be good if he would go first, but it's not the end of the world. No, and I mean, I can also intro some of that, too, since I'm both on the school or was on the School of Public Health and I'm on the OVPR group. But um, yeah, I think Michael and Shalini and I did talk about if we could ask people who've already sunrise to kind of share their experience. So Mark, if you would like to share some of your successes and some of the, you know, if you have any pitfalls on sodas, that would be fantastic. Especially the biggest thing we get is how people are thinking about reworking their studies in this new way. So maybe some of, you know, kind of the thought process that went into how y'all pivoted would be really, really helpful for some of the people I think who are deciding whether or not they should go forward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so does is such a great example. So I can probably plan on talking about that. If Michael doesn't join until a little bit later, um, it sounds like it makes sense for Liz to go first. She's got more of the history working with the OBPR. <clears throat> and then if Michael doesn't join yet, then we'll just hear from Shalini. And then Michael will just, whenever he shows up, we'll just work it in and I could talk about sodas and we could take Q&A. Sounds good. Um, Are you going to want to share your screen at all, Shalini? My screen? Yeah. I don't have anything to share. All right. I, then I don't have to do anything for you. I thought this, <laughs> yeah, I did not prepare any slides or anything. Um, That's cool. And Mark, very quickly, congrats on all those grants. Oh my God, it's absolutely bonkers. <laughs> it just, I, but that's, I mean, it's a good position to be in, so congrats. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the past, the past one or two evaluations, evaluations with um, Diane, like, do you need help getting these funded? One of these going to get funded? And I'm like, man, I think, I think you're going to be, something big is going to happen. She thought I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I told you. <laughs> okay, so I think we should start. All right, I'll let everybody who's waiting in, I see we have 28 people waiting. 
none of whom are oaks. <laughs> so I will mute myself and let everybody in. Hey, Jeff, if you have a minute um, after you get us started, if, if, you, if you have a way of maybe searching for Michael, that would be great. I'm actually right, going to text him right now. Oh, okay. Excellent. Texting is perfect. All right. I want to make sure he has the updated link. We changed the link, Shalini. Um, should I just, do you mind resending it? I'll or actually I can, I mean, do you, do, do one of you mind resending it? And I can just say, um, hey, Michael, we're wait, um, please join, um, please join the seminar. We're resending the link. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. All right, I just texted him, hopefully he'll. Are we, are we ready, Jeff? Oh, here we go. Okay, good. Oh, I see Michael, great. Oh, okay, he's, uh, yeah, he's trying to get in. Good morning. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, I think we're ready to start. I think everybody's in. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the first uh, epic seminar of the academic year. Hope you're all well and off to a good start during this unprecedented challenging time um, in the beginning of the semester. We're going to start the seminar series with this important topic of the university returning to face-to-face -face human research. We're going to hear progress and updates on this topic from three leaders in SPH and the OBPR who've been working nearly around the clock for months to get us to the point where we can begin returning to our research in the field and the clinic. So last spring, the risk benefit ratio of all our face-to-face -face research swung dramatically in the wrong direction and we came to a screeching halt. Now, due to the hard work of many people at the U and elsewhere, we can begin um, starting the process of resuming with all the necessary precautions, such that the risk of COVID transmission to our research participants, students, staff, and faculty can be sufficiently low to satisfy the risk benefit ratio of our face-to-face -face research. Our panelists this, mor this morning will discuss the details of the research sunrise plans and procedures and then they'll take your, your questions. Um, and please uh, use the Zoom tools to raise your hand to ask a question or use the chat box in Zoom to type in your question. So our panelists are Michael Oakes, Professor of Epidemiology and Community Health, and he's the Associate Vice President for Research in the Office of the Vice President for Research. Shalini Kalasingham, Professor of Epidemiology and Community Health, and Liz Hinsky, is the Division Administrator of Epidemiology and Community Health. So, so welcome. And I, I think that um, we're gonna hear from Michael Oakes first, um, but I'm not exactly sure, so take it away. Mark, thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone. Um, it's a lovely turnout on Zoom. Um, it's a privilege to be in front of you, I guess, electronically. Um, and have this first epi seminar um, of this term. Hope everyone's safe and sound. Um, as Mark said, we're going to talk today about sunrise and COVID stuff and research. Um, and I've decided that the only thing worse than Zoom is Zoom with PowerPoint. So I'm just going to talk. I've got some notes and I'll sort of walk us through. And then my friends and colleagues, Liz and Shalini, will um, fill in thereafter. So indulge me for a few minutes. Um, so today's seminar is hopefully a, a rich Q&A conversation. And so I don't want to talk too long. But in order to um, situate or locate the conversation, let us bring us back to um, late January, um, pre-COVID. Um, I can say that I learned about COVID, I think, December 20. Um, in a conversation uh, in the OVPR 
And, um, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be bad. And then some of my friends and colleagues, even in virology, were like, oh no, this won't be bad. Um, and of course, it's bad. So it's a very interesting time and, um, and all that. I'm going to be speaking um, from my role as a professor, as a researcher, but um, also in my role as Associate Vice President for Research. I have the privilege of working in the Central Administration, um, have been for a couple of years now. And in that role, um, the Senior Vice President for Research, Chris Kramer, who's, who's my boss, um, assigned me um, to handle mostly the human health sciences. A colleague handles the better animals and I have the more challenging animals, the humans. Um, and so in that work, um, it's been my job to first shut down, pause, um, the portfolio of research that we do, and then of course now to sunrise it. And it's odd because I think someone competent should be doing this, but um, it actually falls on my shoulders. So um, let's, let me tell you the story from my perspective as I know it. Um, in late February, um, COVID was beginning to be recognized uh, in America and heat up, and we knew we had a big problem. And the problem was, of course, safety with respect to people, our staff, our colleagues, our community, um, as well as our research animals and other aspects of our enterprise. And so like every research university or research center, and yes, we talk, there are some really good email listservs um, for senior research officers. Um, we began communicating like, now what? So um, our research portfolio at Minnesota is about $1 billion. I'm not sure everyone appreciates how big and diverse it is, but it's literally a B, like billion dollars. Um, and that's pretty large. Uh, Michigan's much bigger, um, but um, we're near the top, uh, certainly for public research institutions. And so we, if you remember at the time, it wasn't really clear what was gonna happen with COVID. Uh, it's still not clear, but it was more uncertain, at least in my seat. Um, how bad was it more like Ebola or the flu or someplace in between? Um, and so we wanted, we needed to shut everything down. Um, to make sure that people were safe. And so this shutdown was, of course, shutting down research involving human beings. Um, I'll talk more about that, you know, this morning. But also other aspects I'll share. Shut down clinical laboratories. Shut down chemical and physical science and biological science laboratories. And these aren't easy because some actually need human attention. So frankly, they don't blow up. I mean, there's literally some places that you need to have someone checking stuff out every so often for pure safety reasons. We have a research pharmacy here on campus that has lots of drugs um, and that needs to be secure and sometimes um, um, checked in on. And then there's this whole area of tech commercialization. This is things like someone has a cool innovative idea, a drug device, a new scale, some sort of metric. And there's business involved in that and legal contracts and it's super complicated and super important. So all that needed to come to a grinding halt. And so really February through May, um, my job and my colleagues and friends jobs was to shut things down. Um, and it was um, difficult. Um, text messages were 24 seven and um, you know, it's a big diverse place. Um, University of Minnesota is one of the very few fully comprehensive research, research universities with a vet school, a medical school, and, you know, more traditional campus. So that was challenging um, and difficult. I was briefed on plans for um, who gets ventilators and who doesn't. And um, it was hard. Um, uh, you know, my friends in medicine, I think, are trained to think about these life and death death decisions, but I, I was not. And so looking at that stuff in black and white, black and white ink um, was really difficult um, with everything else. So we had to consider things like euthanizing all of our research animals. This wasn't out of spite, but because they, we weren't sure they could be cared for. Uh, the food, the care, the water, and if it wasn't safe because we don't have enough PPE, um, you know, masks and gloves and sanitizer, which we didn't. 
um, how many could we properly care for? And so we had models of everything going very well and models of a complete uh, euthanasia of all the animals. And um, I have to say that really tugged at my heart as well. So we were working all this, all this stuff and, and this was the shutdown period. And it's, it's you know, I, I say shutdown, but we're really talking about a pause because it wasn't really, you know, fully shut down. It was just pausing everything so we could get our bearings and then begin to see how to dig out. And no one knew what the timelines were at the time. The medical side, my friends in medicine, which I'm deeply involved with because of my work, some of you know, um, um, Vice President Tolar was renting, buying um, uh, big semi-truck trailers for cooling uh, for bodies. Um, and this was, um, you know, these kinds of conversations we're having two or three times a day. Um, now we're sort of past that, thanks, thank goodness. And now we're talking about opening things back up. Um, and we, I wanted to open things back up slowly with respect to what I'll call face-to-face -face human participant research. Some people say subjects, um, you know, there's debate about the right words, but if I say participant or subject, it's human subjects research. And I say face-to-face -face research because um, we, I wanted everyone to go if possible to online stuff. So internet surveys, computer science stuff, all of that um, was never paused. Interestingly, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, there was some people who've asked for permission to sunrise their internet survey, um, but none of that was ever needed. Um, as some of you know, um, department chairs especially and dean's offices were involved in return to work permission um, authorizations. Because um, with the governor's order to work from home, um, a person was not allowed to come to the university unless they were an essential worker. So there was extensive discussions of who was essential and who not. And I'll just share for my faculty colleagues, faculty were deemed not essential um, at a university, um, which caused some consternation. But if, of course, that was only for safety reasons and not for who really mattered. Um, but I'll note there was some, some chuckles and funny conversations about that, even though it was obviously deadly serious. So um, now I'll focus on the work that I spent a lot of time on, which is this face-to-face -face human subject research. The first thing I'll say is almost entirely, this is what I'll call IRB, Institutional Review Board or Ethics Board regulated research. Um, that is work that has to go through the IRB to get permission to proceed. But in fact, it's a little bit broader than that. If you could imagine concentric circles, that's the biggest sort of inner circle, but there's a little circle just beyond it um, because there is some research with human beings that does not need IRB approval. And we wanna make sure that the rules we're talking about and the procedures encompass the larger circle that has all research with human beings. Some of you know that some of this work is exempt from IRB and some of it doesn't even need to be reviewed by the IRB. Um, it's not even part of the, the federal policy if you want. But anyway, so when I speak of this, um, again, I'm just being more casual for a conversation, but this is all work with human beings. We have at the University of Minnesota about 4,500, 4,500 active open IRB protocols. It's a huge system, uh, one of the biggest in the country. And um, we first shut all of this down, like stop what you're doing. But you can imagine, I mean, immediately we knew that some studies could not and should not be shut down. These are mostly studies in clinical research, mostly medicine, that are appropriately entangling research with treatment. You might have um, a study um, going on where you're trying a new medicine, a new therapy of some form for people with cancer or any other um, you know, life-threatening ailment. And um, while it's research, it's also offering hope and in fact, maybe hopeful for many people. So shutting that down um, is kind of not an option. But what we did is we sort of shut down recruitment for that stuff. 
um, in people that were already on study, as we say, receiving a therapy of some form, um, were permitted to go. So we needed a way to think about which studies should go forward, which studies should we not only continue to do, but seek more research in to address COVID, to be honest, um, in which we could pause for a little while. And so we, um, my colleagues and I in Central developed this IRB tier system, and you might've heard of it, it's a tier one through five. And the goal of this was sort of to triage in some conceptual fashion, um, the priority of studies for focus, for our focus in administration. In tier one was COVID focused treatment studies. And we, this was, we wanted more of this right away. And so we wanted a path for our colleagues and some of you to conduct research on COVID and COVID treatments and COVID therapies without interruption. Tier two was medically necessary studies such as the cancer studies I spoke of. Um, studies that have high direct benefit to participants. Tier three were similar but lower, lower or low direct benefit to subjects. Tier four was minimal or no direct benefit to subjects. And importantly, no direct benefit to subjects can oftentimes and typically are really great studies, but they're focused on policies for the population and that a particular person um, who needed care. Uh, tier five was sort of a catch all everything else category. So we use this tier system to really categorize the 4,500 studies we had and the bolus of new studies coming in. Um, because the medical community, of course, as well as pharmacology, dentistry, public health, um, all had great ideas to do COVID related research. So that's what we did and we had this uh, five tier system and I, I dare say it worked very well. Um, pardon me for a minute, I'll move my, my notes. Um, I'm really proud of the work we've done here at University of Minnesota. And I'll just speak for a minute about some of the stuff that went on in medicine, because that's where I was really close to in this time of crisis. Um, there was groundbreaking work on medicines such as Losartan, um, remdesivir, um, study, you know, medicines and therapies that we thought might work, or some people speculated, or some people said definitely worked um, and want to do research on those. Others such as hydroxychloroquine, um, which turned out not to be helpful for most people. There was work on low cost ventilators, not just the engineering, but how do you test it? Um, work on low cost ECMO systems. I mean, all brand new. I mean, just, you know, text coming at 9 p.m. on a Sunday of let's do this right now and how do we get authorization? Um, obviously, antibody testing, some of their early work and continue work was done right here at Minnesota. High throughput genetic testing for COVID tests. Uh, you may not know, but our genetic center is a leader in this area and will soon have probably at least 5,000 tests per week capacity with a very easily scalable uh, throughput if there's enough money and there, there seems like there will be. And finally, we're doing some work right now this past week, I've, two weeks, I've spent on convalescent plasma and um, trials for that, which of course is critical. I'll come back to that. Um, so other things that we were trying to interface with that talks about all this is uh, on sponsored projects, so external grants, if you will. Um, you know, some people couldn't work. And so what were the rules about paying staff um, if one cannot work? Um, and that got super complicated because honestly, the administration, that is the government, um, changed their opinion sort of midstream. And that said, oh yes, you can pay people on grant only if you've exhausted all other resources. Um, at a big university, that's a high bar. So uh, that was super complicated stuff. Um, as we worked um, to do this tier system, the triage, to think about care, as well as um, the work of, let's call it non-medical research, that is non-therapeutic stuff, but critically important, such as health disparities with respect to COVID, um, other, other areas that you and I might work on. 
Um, we were having calls all the time. There's a medical leader, senior medical leaders call that I'm on. But um, this idea of a huddle call, I'll just share, turned out to be super effective. The idea of a huddle call is you might have different layers of people at different levels. Some people on the ground floor doing the work all the way up to more gray haired administrators. And you check in just for five minutes uh, every day or twice a day and just share things. Um, the communication at the university, and frankly, every big place, was so essential during the crisis, it's hard to describe. Um, we're a big, super diverse, and quite siloed place in general. So how do you get people to coordinate and work together, be on message with respect to stopping things and now opening things or sunrising things? A massive challenge, and it's, you know, had I known this was gonna be happening, I'm not sure what I would have taken this job, but here I am. So um, we got it all paused. Um, and um, I think COVID is more stable in some sense, unfortunately, I wish it was getting better, but there's more stability now. So here we go to sunrise or in, in more clear terms to reopen university um, research and um, let research, so I'm calling this sunrise. And we wanted to dovetail with the university presidents, sort of come back to work sunrise, but research sunrise is a subset and has some distinct characteristics. So as I mentioned in the human world, human research world, that's my job. And um, how do I wanna do it? How should we have done it? Um, there's a great tension in an organization such as the university of having everything controlled centrally. But in my office, I simply cannot know all the nuances and characteristics of research going on in dance, um, arts, art history, all the way through public health, sociology, medicine, and so forth, engineering. So we need people who are closer to the work um, to be helpful. And, um, you know, I batted this around, we tried a couple models. We ended up um, with relying on amazing group of people on campus called Associate Deans for Research. These are people who work for every dean in, this, in the university. Uh, every dean sort of runs her or his own school or college. Um, and the Associate Dean for Research or ADR is of course the person in that school responsible for research. So my plan was to work with uh, the deans, the Associate Deans for Research. There's about six of them who do human subjects research in their school and effectively set up a system for Sunrise where um, a great committee um, and Liz Hinsky, who's here um, is on that committee as well as a few others, small and nimble, would send some forms, a template form to each associate dean for research. This is all in collaboration, we meet all the time. And then have the associate dean for research send these forms to her or his faculty colleagues. They'd fill out the forms, they'd review them themselves and effectively sign off. And then the Associate Dean for Research would send us, me and my team here, uh, team you know, for Sunrise, the same form we'd discuss and see if we liked their plan. The basic idea of the plan is to protect people, um, to elevate the issue of COVID protection in this otherwise, you know, regular research or IRB approved research. One of the key questions that we had to face was who should do this review of these plans for safety, for COVID safety. And um, obviously the IRB, the ethics board, plays a key role in protecting subjects. But it turns out that COVID certainly now is not really a research risk. It's a risk of everyday life um, that obviously gets entangled with research if we want someone to come to campus and take a test or whatever. So I made the decision to separate um, COVID reviews, COVID sunrise from normal IRB reviews. This is because we, I certainly didn't want the IRB to review new consent forms involving COVID risks. Um, the, consent form that was already approved was for the study. Now we have this extra layer, but I wanted it to be separate. 
the IRB only has so much capacity. Um, those volunteers and members already work so hard. So it didn't seem feasible bureaucratically. So anyway, um, we made it separate. And that's an important point I want to share with all you guys so that you're clear that the COVID approvals are separate from the IRB. Now it's a little, it's not completely different because the IRB also reports to me the whole system uh, administratively. So I get to you know, have a foot in each camp, if you will. So what happens is that a researcher with her associate dean of research will submit a sunrise approval and we fill out some stuff and say, I'm gonna be safe in these ways. And we might say, okay, make it safer here or you're good there. Uh, we get approval and then the researcher um, takes a letter that I send, which is a very intense letter saying, you attest to do all these things or we're taking your firstborn son, a um, little, little Zoom comedy. Um, and then you submit that letter to the IRB with a request to be free to resume. The IRB's job is really to acknowledge just simply acknowledge in a you know, database bureaucratic kind of way that they have received my letter, this official letter you know, on special stationery, uh, and that they agree to the terms. The IRB will then approve the study to go forward. They have the final approval as they should. And so unless there's something weird, like there's some other you know, error or violation, the researcher is then free to go um, and continue the research. There's issues of monitoring. I mean, how, if someone says we're going to use PPE in the field, how do I know they are? To be honest, we're just trusting people. Um, you know, my stance is the faculty, researchers, and so forth should be trusted unless proven otherwise. And so, yeah, it's an honor system, but I'm proud of that honor system. So that's that's the basic story. And so the the Sunrise structure is associate dean for research focused. This has caused a little tension in some places around campus where uh, some people um, have centers and other things that aren't so sort of school or college focused. That's just how they work. Um, but I've insisted that the Sunrise stuff goes through the ADR, uh, not in any way to slay people, just so that we have some sense of here's six or eight people that are sort of making these decisions. I, I um, want to say that um, I always thought, and it turns out to be true, that sunrising in the health sciences, including public health, of course, um, is not hard. Um, many public health and certainly medical, dental, and related um, professions have infection control you know, in all of their training, in their DNA, if you will, their professional DNA. I always worried more about our colleagues and friends in um, dance or art history or sociology or school of management um, who don't think as much and haven't thought as much in general as we have. So those sunrise applications tend to be more challenging. Um, I'm delighted to say that um, with permission, I've offered some exemplary applications from, from you guys, from, our, from our epi epidemiology in community health as, hey, here's how to write an outstanding um, sunrise request. So, so that's an interesting thing. Um, I'll just uh, want to close with a couple of, um, I don't know, interesting observations I've had over the past six months. I thought I'd share a few things. Um, first, as we talk about research and now sunrise research, um, the issue of research in an emergency turns out to be super difficult. Um, do we follow the rules of good research, randomization, good measurement, and so forth? And of course, regulatory compliant, FDA rules, uh, IRB rules, when the house is on fire? Um, my answer is yes, but not in a ridiculous way. One needs to flex. And so it's been challenging at times to insist on following the rules, again, methodological rules, as well as administrative bureaucratic rules, when people's lives are literally at risk. I will share and confess that I think it was in April, I got a text early Saturday morning from a lead physician who said they needed emergency use, use authorization to do some therapy on someone who was very ill. 
And I said, let's do it. Um, it was a mistake. And um, um, I shouldn't have done it. I, I, I extended my authority too far, not like from my boss, but what should be done. Um, and I'll just share with you, um, some of you know me, I said I should resign for this mistake. Um, no one would accept my resignation, but um, that pressure that I've not experienced ever before, um, where someone's life is on the line and there's someone telling me that they can save them, um, I said yes and I should have said no. Um, it turned out well in the end, but um, some of those decisions I'd never imagined in my career I'd ever have to make. This issue of entangling research with care becomes so much more amplified in this current pandemic. Um, I mentioned the um, issue of cancer patients needing care. So um, we want to protect against people for COVID, but if you're coming into the hospital to be simple anyway, for treatment, for cancer, a broken leg, um, how much more risk is there to add on a survey or a blood draw for COVID? Not much. And so we're trying to be flexible in that space, but it's something I never really imagined of sort of overlapping and partic part partitioning risks. A key issue um, is that if one is doing research, that is technically a systematic investigation designed to yield generalizable knowledge that's different from quality improvement or quality assurance that a, any organization, often a hospital will do to improve their processes. If you're doing QI, QA, you don't need IRB or even my office's approval. If you're doing research, you do. That line gets gray when you're trying to save lives. And um, I'll just say that there's no easy answer. It's why we can't have a computer algorithm to say this is human judgment. And I think we've done it right, um, but it's been a challenge. Another observation. My office, we offered um, COVID rapid response grants, a little bit of money to people around campus, faculty around campus who want to do research with an operational impact. That is quick research that would inform decision makers of how to respond to COVID, to the house that's on fire. Um, you and epidemiology, my friends and colleagues did wonderful, but I couldn't give away all the money that was allocated to me. Um, many colleagues on campus really couldn't figure out that, yes, I was serious when I said we need results fast and results that would inform a decision maker's um, activity. Many people kept talking about research that was really wonderful research, but that would yield results two or three years down the road or a journal article. I just note that in public health, I'm not sure we emphasize, and I've thought about this since, um, how sometimes quick, actionable research is so vital um, to helping. Last, I guess last, maybe there's two things. One, I wanna talk about for a moment, convalescent plasma. You might've heard in the news that it, it may be, our friends at Mayo say that giving ill people with COVID convalescent plasma can save them. Uh, under some pressure, it seems, from President Trump, um, the FDA gave an expanded use authorization, EUA, technically, uh, for use of convalescent plasma, which is to say that physicians can now prescribe convalescent plasma as a treatment. Our colleagues in medicine here um, aren't so sure about the benefit of this therapy and want to run and be part of actually a large national clinical trial to test the efficacy and safety of convalescent plasma. Fine, straightforward research. The challenge is, what do we do at major healthcare centers like Minnesota? Do you offer convalescent plasma only in the research framework? You get it 50-50 chance of getting it or some saline placebo, or do you offer it for research, 50-50 chance, and separately, if you want, for regular care under the EUA thing. And then what happens when someone is in the trial, you know, and they're in the placebo group perhaps, and then it's life and death. Do you break the trial and give them convalescent plasma despite really, I dare say the scientific community's most consensus that it's not helpful? 
these are challenges about sunrise that I think are subtle. I just wanted to share with you, this is, this is what I think about all day and it's a challenge. Finally, one more little nuance. Um, we wrote and uh, now require this COVID information sheet, which is a two page, you know, front and back paper for research participants that says, here's the risk of COVID. Hopefully everyone knows, but not everyone, to be honest. It's written in plain language. And the key message is that research is voluntary. You don't have to participate. And we want this information sheet to go to all participants more than 24 hours before their visit. Straightforward. And for us in Epi, it's you send an email or snail mail, whatever else. Um, but it turns out uh, these are challenging things. In medicine, if one does not have HIPAA approval, you can't email a participant this COVID information sheet unless it's encrypted. And the encryption thing's a whole nother game. So there's these very subtle things. Um, you know, we have people in communities up north, uh, up near Ely, uh, who don't have access to email. Um, and so how do you make sure they get the information sheet before you see them? I mean, it's a logistical challenge. So you leave it in the church, in the CVS, in the union hall, um, in the community center, and put up some posters, or do you somehow, I mean, how do you get it to these people, this sort of simple idea of, oh, let's just tell people here's some extra risk of COVID and you can't find it. Anyway, I'll now toss, uh, give it over to, I think, Liz or Shalini, um, and thank you for your time. Liz, why don't you go and then I'll go next. Okay, um, I'll share a little bit um, from my perspective about, oh. Well, we have time for questions. I mean, it's already 40 minutes in. So I, I'm just worried we're gonna run out of time. Uh, I'll just speak for about three minutes if that works. Um, I just wanna share a little bit about the School of Public Health Sunrise in particular. Um, so once we found out through Michael that this was going to be an ADR responsibility because each college is gonna to have to kind of deal with their own particular research and how that gets sunrised, um, the coordination efforts began at the school. So since we don't have an acting ADR, it became a collaborative type of a work group where we had representation from all the different divisions. And to kind of kick things off, I, I did research on other sunrise plans throughout the nation, Washington, uh, World Health Organization advice, and kind of pulled from a lot of different areas collaborated with some of the other colleges um, at the U just to kind of see that we were on the same page. Because really the ultimate help for faculty in this is kind of what Michael was getting at with that participant sheet is thinking about all of the nuances. How do you kind of think about all the little parts of your research that might need to pivot or might need to be thought of in a different way. And so sure we have the project narrative form that OBPR requires, but really we wanted to kind of give the faculty uh, a kind of a, a bit of support in how they could think about sunrising. So on the um, School of Public Health's internet, um, there is a COVID um, research section. Um, I'll quick share my screen here and show you, let's see where that is because I guess some of the links have been broken. So I'm just gonna really quickly share where this is on our, um, on our school of public health internet here. So over here, if you just go to a SPH internet, over here is the COVID-19 intranet page. And if you click on that, oh, I guess it got moved. See, this is what I mean. And that's why I just wanted to quickly share my screen because some people are having a difficult time finding um, the toolkit. And so under researchers, and then this should open up the toolkit for how to restart, restart the research. And it's got some examples, some templates, some FAQs, and then the required forms that get sent to OVPR. And if you do decide to sunrise, um, your uh, study narrative template gets sent to Joe Weisenberger and Dean Finnegan. Those two are right now acting as the official signers for our um, ADR. But, um, and I, I do actually have a pre um, submitted question. So I'm hoping as well, Aaron, that we have some time for Q&A. So that's all I can share. 
And very quickly, I am on the Council of Research Associate Deans, even though um, there is no official um, a research associate dean for the School of Public Health. And so if you guys have particular questions around um, and this, and this encompasses everything from space that's being used to visiting scholars, to having your students go out for field experiences and what that means and their potential for exposing others, what they need to sign, um, anything like that if you guys have questions please do feel free to email me and i can bring them up on this committee because this committee deals with everything that's not related in particular to this particular type of research that you're doing but everything around that like the physical environment anything around exposures and it's really just getting the information out and sharing it with each other so that we can say you know this is how we're dealing with it um, and so if there's anything in in regards to that, please do feel free to email me and um, at some point, depending on when the questions come, we can also talk about uh, our experience in Tanzania, where we have a country that is that has um, decided the president has decided there's no COVID. So we had active research and then had to make a decision about what to do there. But let's uh, open it up for questions. Okay, so people can uh unmute and start talking you can share your screen when you do that if you want to i mean show your video <clears throat> use the raise hand tool so this is aaron i didn't see the raise hand tool and uh, i'd sent you messages and hadn't gotten a response so i thought i'd try verbally so um can people now submit phase four study plans um, for in-person research, uh, say at ECRC, or, you know, we have, for, for example, people who need to come in for imaging at a university center that's set up to handle, you know, one person at a time. Um, and uh, beyond just that, those simple questions about yes or no, have the responsibilities for ECRC as a building versus studies been posted someplace? I remember way back a couple months ago that info was supposed to be available. Thanks. Well, Aaron, I guess I'll try to answer. Um, I understand that Kamakshi uh, in charge of ECRC has done a fabulous job of a approved protocol for safety in that center. Um, and um, investigators around campus are most welcome to submit any study they want to their to the IRB. And in certain circumstances, they'll be bounced for COVID protection to our committee, um, in this case through Liz, uh, which is just fine. Um, I don't see any restrictions in any way. Um, I, look, I'll just dare say that I think Kamakshi's done a, I mean, the ECRC protocol is is amazing. So there's no more restrictions. It's just a matter of details and when. This is Simon. Um, one quick comment. Um, I've had a study, study Sunrise and it was a good experience. The one thing that I would warn people about, it got confusing from the person trying to do the Sunrising or submit applications on what gets submitted by an email and what has to go through say ethos or something else. We had a bit of confusion there. The other thing, Michael, as feedback, um, I don't know if you've thought of any kind of evaluation that as we sunrise and as we do things, if we find that there's pieces of protocol that didn't work out or need to be changed between say a pilot and a um, full test. I don't know um, uh, whether you're open to feedback or saying, you know, we ended up dropping this because it couldn't work in the real circumstance. Thanks, Simon. Um, I think we've solved that um, email or ethos problem that was part of the challenges we had early on. Um, and now in the letter that I send to people who are sun risen or so, I don't know, sunrise, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's more clear. It is clear uh, how to do that and the IRBs on board. And yeah, look, I, <laughs> I get feedback all day of things to improve. <laughs> and so uh, that's the way it goes. And that's my job. And so I'm happy to, to work on any of that for sure. The other question I had, Michael, I think you said this, but I just want to double check. If you've got a study that's entirely online and COVID-19 isn't relevant, 
you just carry on doing your normal thing, right? We don't have Correct. to send out. Okay. Correct. But from the start, actually, um, anything fully online uh, is not restricted in any way. In fact, we're encouraging people to shift to online if possible. Of course, not everything can, but yeah. if possible, that's the way to go. Um, and um, it's free to go. Cool. Thanks. So Liz responded to me about ECRC um, requirements in the chat, but um, Liz, can you tell us or somebody whether studies that are doing the kinds of things we do at ER ECRC have been approved? And are the, Michael had mentioned sharing templates of successful proposals. Are those on the intranet site as well? Sure, I can uh, take a stab at that, Aaron. So we've had one um, study in the ECRC Sunrise already, that's Mark Soda's um, grant. And I don't think I have actually put the examples Michael mentioned on our intranet. They're actually, I think, on the OVPR website right now, but I can certainly piggyback on those. And I believe Mark's is one of them. Um, and so I think the first step and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, is to connect with Peg and or Kamakshi to talk about how your study and the activities you want to engage in at ECRC fit in with their safety plan. I know scheduling is probably the biggest hurdle because of course we want those breaks of times and the gap and, and between participants and, and for the cleaning and for the um, ventilation. There's been a lot of changes. The owner of the ECRC building has been extremely helpful in kind of ramping up some of the ventilation issues and, and partitioning and kind of some of the other um, uh, physical um, improvements to make this space more suitable to, to seeing participants again. So I would first connect with them, but yeah, I will make sure um, hopefully by the end of the day, I can connect with Sarah Bjorkman and we can get some of those templates on our intranet. Um, but it, I, I mean, Mark can share how it's been going, but I've heard Peg and Kamakshi have a fantastic plan. It's really well thought out. We threw it through the OVPR and they thumbs up. So um, I think they more than anybody else have really, um, because they're kind of a little bit more of a hybrid clinical setting, have really taken um, this to heart and have great PPE and they've training for their staff and all that. So I hope that helps. Yeah, I would, I would second all of that. Um, they've just done an incredible job. Um, at, at times we felt like, you know, um, why is this taking so long, but had to remind ourselves how important it was to be methodical um, before returning uh, research participants to the clinic. Um, and so now we're, our, our tr we have a trial in adults with type 2 diabetes, which is a COVID red flag, obviously, one of many. Um, so, you know, we have to be really, really careful. We are collecting blood and, 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 and things like that and taking a lot of measurements from these people uh, face to face. We learned so much from, from the people working at the ECRC from Kamakshi and I would just also give a ton of credit to my research coordinator, Sarah Rydell. Um, and if it weren't for her and all the other folks, we, we wouldn't be where we are. So I think it is a really, really good model. Um, we do a lot of similar things as the cohort studies, and even though it's a trial, it is it is tier four. It's a it's a you know it's not a very you know it's not a very particularly therapeutic intervention or anything like that. It's a behavioral intervention. Hi, this is uh, this is Jill, and I wanted to follow up on that, which is um, I wonder if the, any of the panelists have any uh, advice of, well, for PIs about calibrating risk to participants as mark mentioned not every participant is at the same risk of severe outcomes and so we have some studies where participants have underlying conditions or they're immunocompromised or they're elderly and then you know some procedures require technicians to be right up very close to participants others like interviews they could be more distant so all this it's hard for me to sort of calibrate what what the risk, uh, what the risk is. Well, Jim, that's, um, that's really the great question. Uh, is another data point worth someone's life? Um, I don't know. 
I think there's way, I mean, the whole plan here is to mitigate the risks as much as possible. Um, I imagine from, you know, seats such as yours, um, you really want to think about, you know, the timing of this. I mean, let's, let's hope that there's a vaccine and people are more safe five, six months from now. Uh, can you delay that, you know, longitudinal study data point? I'm not going to say you can't. Um, you know, of course, we see the details, but, um, you know, from a PI's perspective, that's the great question. Obviously, the IRB will look at it. Obviously, my office looks at it. We might say no, but we're not saying no at this time until the, the nitty gritty details. We obviously want um, PIs to be simple, to share who, you know, demographic COVID risk profile they're working with. Um, but there's no you know, there's no pure restriction. There's a um, question from Stacy Moe here. Uh, for, for single IRB studies, are the steps for the Sunrise Plan the same? And she's referring to tier four studies. And I think that's a simple yes, but. That's correct, it's yes. Maybe I'll share with the group that while this, the step, this, the tier thing is still in place, it doesn't matter much anymore. Um, all studies with a proper COVID protection plan are welcome. Um, we will, if, if we're otherwise, um, if, we're, if we only have so much capacity, focus on the higher, the, I guess the lower tiers, tier one, two, and three over tier four. But right now there's plenty of capacity to get through. So there's, there's no restrictions in that triage system. I did want to mention that the um, Department of Health and Safety, and in particular, the Department of Environmental Health and Safety, has been um, very helpful in terms of thinking through the physical space and have people um, whom you can contact who can actually kind of come out and look and provide guidance on, you know, how do you, what else do you need to do to kind of to institute measures that would be, um, that would help you adhere to some of the recent recommendations around COVID-19. Um, a couple things. Uh, Diane Newmark Steiner um, uh, just wanted to, to publicly send a huge thanks to, to the panel and, and all the other folks who have worked so hard on this. And um, Diane also brings up something that's been really interesting to me as well. She says, many of our faculty have been so creative in moving to online and phone research. It'll be interesting to see how this moves forward after COVID. And my SODAS trial is an excellent example of that because we had research participants in the trial when the ECRC and pretty much everywhere else was shut down. And we had a pivot and we collected so much data uh, remotely that we would have collected in the ECRC just by being creative. So delivering devices to their homes, making sure that you know we used the PPE when we did that and making sure everything was sterilized and people, the subjects were able to put the devices on their bodies, the continuous glucose monitor, the physical activity accelerometer. We would leave a scale on their porch so that they could get the body weight. We even had them leave, leave us a urine sample. All this had to be approved, of course, because it's not an online survey, but we learned a whole lot about how you could be creative and do research uh, in the field with perhaps in some cases, the same quality as you would having them come into the clinic. So I think that is really interesting how some of this experiences might, might change the nature of how we do research uh, moving forward, which, which I think is, you know, there are some silver linings here maybe. One challenge we've had is um, thinking about, we often taxi people in who are older and so they don't have to drive and deal with parking. Many of them are willing to do that, but others aren't. Has anybody come up with a creative idea on uh, getting people around um, uh, that follows the guidelines? I mean, there are medical taxi services and so forth. And of course we have that van that's in the parking lot, but if anybody's thought about that, I'd like to hear it. Sure, I've thought about this a lot. There's no easy way. This is part of the risk of collecting the data point. Is it worth putting someone's life at risk for the data point? 
with mitigation strategies, I, that's always the ultimate question. There's no good way for people who don't drive their own private car by themselves or in their own viral unit um, to get to a research site. It's, it's true in medicine, it's true for your studies and so many others. Yeah, you're talking about zero risk, but um, you know, is there something that's quite low risk? Um, you know, people are at risk walking outside, you know, going to their dentist's office and some people decide they're willing to take that risk and not. I think we can mitigate it to extremely low. Um, but again, the transportation is the one thing that's been a challenge for us. Well, you, I mean, you'd want someone to wear a mask in the cab or bus or related things. I mean, that's the, that's the point I'm talking about. The transportation um, with risk mitigation would also have some sort of PPE component. With just a few minutes, I'm wondering if there's a student um, who might have a question? You don't even have to show your face. You could just like put it in the chat. I have How one pre-submitted question. I have one pre-submitted question if we have time. So, um, Someone asked, how do we revise budgets? Example, I have a start date of August 1st. Can or I should I revise the start date um, based on when we actually start the work? So sadly, the answer is it depends. Um, you know, it, it's kind of going to depend on your sponsor. And it's also going to depend on the level of activity that is going on in the study. So um, many of the federal sponsors have been very generous in understanding that studies have been paused and revamped. And so a lot of the rules maybe for extensions have been a little bit more lax. So people are planning on no cost extension. So maybe it isn't about changing your start date, but maybe it's about you know planning ahead for an extra um, period to, to um, extend your end date. However, some studies have only a component that is not going on. So maybe you're not doing the face-to-face -face component or incentivizing, but you are still doing some work. So there may still be some effort. So in that case, you wouldn't necessarily need to change your start date. Budget revisions, it's very sponsor specific. So most sponsors allow pretty good leeway in revising your budgets, um, shifting from categories. But I would talk to your individual accountant about your individual project. And then I would also, talk to your sponsor. So this has been coming up a lot lately about subcontracts. So if we were subcontracting to say Chapel Hill to do some clinical intervention and we, they're not sunrised yet, there really isn't a good argument to continue to pay them or to continue to you know, keep that subcontract as it was originally planned. So I would advise you to talk to your accountant because subcontracts can always be modified to change the dates, to change the aims and expectations. So so just uh, connect with your accounting folks on that because this does have an implication on funded projects that we're expecting certain outcomes that aren't able to happen. So, and then as always, I tell people to connect with their program officer if they're not able to sort of meet the aims that they originally intended. So that was a question I had. I, ha I have a point to make. Uh, this, um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about what's going to happen this winter with a lot of indoor activities and things could get substantially worse but in any case it does look as though this is uh this risk of getting COVID-19 is going to last another six months and may last quite a bit longer the experience in 1918 was that it dribbled on through two or three years and so i i just would hope that there is some there, a lot of what we're doing is kind of assuming that this will end, it will peter out over a few months, but uh, there must be some thinking about what might happen if we go out two or three years even. Uh, so my question is, is there that thinking? Yeah, David, we think about that in Central all the time. Um, what happens when students aren't able to come to campus? What happens if federal money dries up? 
um, what happens if this is a long-term restriction. Um, there's some pretty much doomsday scenarios. Yeah. And I guess in response to Aaron's very salient question about taxis, maybe in six months, there'll be enough people that are infected uh, and have some immunity. Uh, maybe uh, there'll be a vaccine. Uh, if things get brighter, you know, if the sun actually rises, uh, it won't be a problem and we'll just have a, a delay, but nobody knows. Oh, thank you all uh, for participating. This has been extremely helpful and informative. You're going to leave us on that note? <laughs> <laughs> we know you're, <laughs> we know that. I, you're, say, I just want to say something that I think we have to think long term but we have to avoid thinking in terms of three years and doomsday and all that. I mean, we need to be practical. I think we can be thinking through, you know, the end of the winter, the beginning of summer, whatever, but just, just to kind of keep it in perspective. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're at the hour. But thank you so much to our panelists and to Mark. Awesome. People start to drop off. So I just want to get in a quick announcement. Um, so the, for the rest of this year, actually, the seminar series is going to continue to focus on COVID and um, diversity, um, equity, and inclusion, and the related problems and strife we've had in our environment and our society. Um, and so the next one will be in two weeks, September 25th, Dr. Sonia Brady, and she's going to present her research on contextual sources of risk and resilience impacting African-American communities in the Twin Cities a community engaged program of research. So I hope you can join us for that. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you.